All right. So today we are here to talk about negative strategy, how to think about debate on the negative, and how to learn about how to make good strategic choices on the negative. So we're going to start uh, a little bit at a granular level about just kind of the 101 basics of the vocabulary, about what we're doing on the negative, about what our goals are. And then we're going to go a little bit deeper into the question of making strategic choices and executing at a more advanced level on the negative. So I always like to start this conversation with a discussion of what the negative's role is, what the negative's job is in the debate. What are we here to set out to do? And so in my mind, there are two distinct but uh, inseparable goals that the negative has in the debate. So one, they need to prove that the AF is a bad idea. They need to win some offense against the AF. And two, they need to mitigate the affirmative's offense. They need to win some defense uh, against the AF. So what are some examples of ways that we can win offense against the AF? We can win a disadvantage. We can win a critique argument. We can win a case turn argument, right? All of those are examples of how we might win offense. How can we win defense, case defense, advantage counter plans, right? Um, sometimes critique alternatives can function as defense. So there are some different ways that we can win offense, some different ways that we can win defense, some different ways that we can go about accomplishing this objective but we need to do both, right? We can't just do one or the other to win the debate. We need to do both. So the ways that we go about doing this are, we need to read a variety of off case positions and we need to make a diversity of defensive arguments in the one and C, right? We need to start the debate off with a lot of options um, from a strategy perspective to allow the negative um, a diversity of options with which to kind of end the debate and double down on. I always like to think of um, ways that the negative can exact pressure on the affirmative. So everything that we're doing on the negative side is about making the life of the affirmative team miserable. Okay, so everything we're doing is about enhancing the pressure that we're placing on the affirmative team and the pressure that we're placing on the subsequent affirmative speeches. And so there are two different sort of ways uh, that you can put pressure. So you can place pressure on the affirmative team horizontally, meaning across different flows, right? So if you read a really big one and C, if you've got a nine off one and C that places a great deal of horizontal pressure on the 2AC. Simple enough of a concept. The other side of that is vertical pressure, placing a lot of depth on your position to the point where it is difficult for the affirmative speeches to come back and answer all of the depth that you've created. If you really go deep on a disadvantage in the negative block, that places quite a bit of vertical pressure on the 1AR. And so oftentimes these are in tension with one another, right? In order for us to create horizontal pressure, we need to extend a lot of positions. In order for us to create vertical pressure, we need the time, right, to develop our arguments on that particular position. And so sometimes these goals might stand a little bit in tension with one another. And so our job is to find the equilibrium point, right? Like what is the equilibrium point with which we can exert maximum horizontal pressure while at the same time uh, exerting maximum vertical pressure. Um, I also like to sort of start out with just the concept of presumption, because I think it's an important, you know, theory, an important sort of vocabulary term to think about. So the idea of presumption is that when taking actions, we sort of have this idea that change is a little bit dangerous, right? So we say, you know, Maybe, maybe we don't want to change the status quo that much if we know that the status quo is fine. So there's a burden that the affirmative team has in order to win the debate. They need to win that the app, uh, you know, is, is better than the status quo. It, it does something that changes the world um, in a better way. They have to cross this presumption barrier, this presumption kind of obstacle to them winning the debate. And on the negative side, this can be a benefit for us, right? We, we get presumption. And so uh, 
you know, we can win defensive arguments that potentially can cross the F below that question, uh, below that threshold of presumption. Now, you might be asking yourself, well, you know, you began this lecture by saying I need to win both offense and defense. And now you're saying to me that there are these theoretical um, debates where maybe the negative can win the debate entirely on defense, right? You can win absolute defense, you can win zero risk of the AF, uh, and you can win the debate that way. Practically, this almost never works out for the negative side. Uh, so yes, true in theory, but in practice, it's very difficult for the affirm for the negative to get the affirmative, uh, the risk of the affirmative all the way down to zero. You would need some egregious dropped arguments in order for this to play out in practice. Um, I had a college debate that involved the concept of presumption once, um, and the judge's comment was zero is a really small number, <laughs> right? So getting the F down to zero risk is an almost impossible task, and you're always better off having an offensive component along in your strategy. So yes, in theory, you can win a debate by reducing the risk of the affirmative down to zero. In practice, not really. So uh, negative debating is all about making strategic choices, okay? It is all about making the debate smaller and smaller down until the 2 and R, when you make a decision about what argument that you go for, what argument that you really stake the debate on, and the argument that you think is going to win, right? So you begin broad in the one and C with the diversity of off case positions. Um, now, uh, and I've, I've talked about this a little bit with my lab, but I've, I see a lot of kind of discourse out there where it's like, well, there's really no kind of one right answer to how big a one and C ought be in an average debate. And I sort of disagree with this because I think that we've sort of tested the premise of what are one and C structures that place maximum pressure on the two AC, right? Because that's our goal with the one and C. We're trying to make life hard and miserable for the two AC. And so we need to balance. We need to read a bunch of, we need to read a diversity of off case positions, but we also need to make sure that our one and C positions are developed enough that we're placing adequate vertical pressure on the two AC. So how do we do that? Um, I think that the equilibrium point in college debate with college times is about five to six off in the one and C. And so minus one minute constructive speeches in high school times, I think that's about four to five. Um, if you're going way over, you are probably reading underdeveloped off case positions that the two AC can blow off. If you're going under, you're probably not exerting maximum horizontal pressure on the two AC. Now that's not to say that there aren't teams that can have success doing that. And you're probably going to see teams that have success reading like nine, 12 off one and C's. You're gonna see teams who have success reading three off one and C's, right? So all of that is possible. I think that the optimum equilibrium point is around four or five off in the one and C. And the other part of this is you wanna leave yourself time early in the debate to kill the case, okay? Strategies that kill the case, I think, are um, wildly successful and at times wildly underrated by debaters, right? Uh, so if you are able to invest in case defense where you're not just, you know, reading a bunch of impact defense cards, but you're making solvency and internal link arguments about the AF, some of them are carded, some of them are really smart logical arguments that you've made with your big brains, right? There are a lot of ways that we can kill the case and we can invest in mitigating the risk of the case and winning defense on the case that are going to make your life so much easier on the negative side. There are so many times where I will see one in C's where they will spend, you know, just two minutes reading some impact defense cards. And after that happens, I go, well, this one in C has wildly um, lowered the number of possible two and R's because they really can't go for DA case in the two and R, right? And so if they have forfeited the DA case to an R because they haven't invested in case defense, they've now made the two ACs life easier, right? There are fewer two and R choices that are available to the negative and the two AC can spend a lot of time answering the counter plans um, or critique alternatives or topicality arguments that they know the neg has to go for because the neg has not spent enough time answering the case, right? So think about ways that you can continue to exert maximum pressure by killing the case by winning defense on the case. Does that make sense to everybody? Awesome. So then we are in the process once again of making the debate smaller, right? So we're splitting the block, right? And the two and C and the one and R narrowing the options of the debate 
right? So the debate is a lot smaller than it once was in the one in C. My uh, recommendations for the block is to have multiple offensive options there. So whether that's multiple, whether that's two disads, whether that is a disad and a case turn, whether that is a critique and a topicality argument or a critique and a, and a process counter plan or something like that, have multiple options in the block, multiple offensive options in the block um, that give you a multitude of ways to ultimately win the debate in the two and R. Okay. So I think that you want to make sure that you're preserving options in the block. Don't go too big, right? Because the block is where you want to start exerting a lot of vertical pressure, right? You want to go well in depth on the positions that you're extending. You don't want to be shadow extending positions. Um, you don't want to be extending, you know, three or four or, or five, you know, off case positions with a negative block because you think the one AR can't cover it. You want to make the debate smaller. And then the two and R, right? We're making the debate even, even smaller. We're going for uh, sort of isolated positions, right? We're going for, um, you know, disadvantage case, disadvantage counter plan case, critique, right? Topicality only. We are making the debate very, very small um, in order to uh, really tell the judge, here's why we're going to win the debate. And here's why um, the affirmative is not going to win the debate, right? So you're trying, you're constantly in a process of making strategic decisions to make the debate smaller. So we'll we'll kind of you know zoom back out and talk a little bit about how it is that we make those strategic decisions. What sort of factors are we thinking about in order to make those strategic decisions? Like what are the things that should be going on in your brain, right? When you're trying to figure out, well, how do I split the block? Or how do I choose what to go for the two and R? How do I choose what to fill up my one and C with? Right. These are all strategic decisions that you should be thinking about deeply. And we'll talk about some of the factors that you want to think about. So everything in debate is you're thinking backwards from the final rebuttal speeches. So when you're negative, you're thinking backwards from the 2 and R. When you're affirmative, you're thinking backwards from the 2 AR. You always want to be thinking about where you're going to be at the end of the debate, not just where you're going to be, you know, at the next speech. So I go into a lot of negative pre-rounds and it's like panic. How do we fill the one and C? Wrong question. <laughs> right question is what are we going for in the two and R? How do we build a block that makes that two and R the most strategic choice? And then how do we craft a one and C is like the last question that you ask, right? So make sure you're thinking backwards from the final rebuttal speeches because that's where you're going to win the debate. You're going to win the debate in the 2 and R. You're not going to win the debate in the 1 and C, so backwards from the 2 and R. So the pre-round question that you should have an answer for when your coach comes to talk to you before the debate is, what is, under ideal circumstances, the 2 and R that you want to go for? We need a plan, okay? Uh, and and, and we, need, we need to have a plan to create a scaffolding for everything else that we're going to do. If we don't have a plan, everything's going to kind of fall apart. So we need to say, okay, under ideal circumstances, I am going for the cap game. Under ideal circumstances, I am going for politics and case. Whatever that answer is for you, and there are a lot of different ways to do this, um, but whatever that answer is for you, you need to have the answer for what your ideal 2 and R is. And then you want to think backwards from there, what is the ideal block split that I will give in order to build up to my ideal to an R. So I've got my A strategy to an R that I know I want to go for. What is the block split that facilitates that to an R? So if I wanna go for politics and case defense in the to an R, great to an R, what you need to do is you need to make sure you're investing a lot of time in case defense and the negative block. Same for the for the one and C, right? If you don't have enough investment in case defense, you can't give a DA case to an R. So you need to make sure you're investing in case defense in the negative block. You also need to make sure that you're, you know, investing enough time in the politics disadvantage to fully flesh out that argument to answer all the two AC arguments. So it's going to need enough time, right? So maybe it needs to be the entire one and R. So the considerations about what your ideal two and R is should then shape the subsequent conversation of what is my ideal block split? How do I craft a block split that leads up to that ideal to an R? Now, I, I, I like to give this caveat here, which is it is important to have a plan about where you wanna be on the negative. 
So I'm always going to say, you want to know what your A strategy is. You want to have a plan for the two and R, but that being said, you want to avoid tunnel vision at all costs. So a common mistake made in high level debates by high level debaters is they had a conversation with their coach about what the ideal two and R is, which is the right conversation to have. That's a good conversation to have, and you should have it with your coaches too. But they, regardless of what happened in the debate, were married to that two and R option and did not have the strategic flexibility with which to change their mind based on what happened during the debate. So you are always making concrete decisions based on what happens in the debate. You are not married to your ideal to an R. You should be able to go for any of the positions that are in the one and C. If you find yourself oftentimes reading one and C positions that you can never go for, you put in like a 20 second A spec shell because you think that's funny, but you can never go for it. Stop doing that. You are doing yourself a strategic disservice. You are not putting pressure on the 2AC by doing that. You're making the, the AF's life easier, not harder. Okay. That time is better spent either reading more cards on an offensive position or better yet, killing the case more. So avoid tunnel visions, avoid tunnel vision, make concrete decisions based on affirmative coverage, based on 2AC coverage, based on 1AR coverage. So if the 2AC has drastically undercovered a position, you should extend that position in the negative block, <laughs> or at least consider extending that position in the negative block, right? Um, you wanna make sure that the affirmative is punished for strategic mistakes that they make. And if you are someone who sort of, maybe you develop a reputation as the team that like always goes for the cap K, or you always go for the politics DA, or you very commonly give a two and R on one position, then affirmative teams are gonna learn those tendencies, right? They, they are smart. They're trying to make your life hard too, right? So affirmative teams are gonna learn your tendencies. They're gonna start to undercover other options in the one and C, and you need to have the strategic flexibility to go for those positions, otherwise, once again, you'll put yourself at a strategic disadvantage because they're going to get to read more arguments against the argument that you want to go for, and you're not going to have anything to do. You're not going to have something to do about it, something to avert it. So um, how do we think about what to go for in the 2 and R? what sort of acceptable two in our strategies there are, what ideal two in our strategies there are, what are the sort of thought processes, considerations that we go into here. Um, and once again, you know, I think most of us know this, but you wanna make sure you're operating in one world, right? So you're not going for multiple counter plans or you're not going for topicality and substance or critique in a different counter plan. Two in ours are always operating in one world right? And you're trying to make strategic choices to make the debate smaller for the negative. Um, but there are a few kind of ways that I think about how to think about ideal two and R's. So one of them is maybe you in the pre sort of in the process of tournament preparation have positions that you really like, or, you know, hopefully you've got generic positions that you think are good, that you think are, you know, you're well practiced on and you're ready to execute them against multiple affirmatives. So I know the cap K, I've got cards about the cap K, I've given practice speeches on the cap K, and in a lot of debates, my ideal two and R is gonna be the cap K. Now that might change because we're gonna have specific case snags to certain affirmatives and there are gonna be specific strategies we wanna go for, and that's all great, but like I'm really well practiced on the cap K, I know the cap K. Or like, I know the politics DA backwards and forwards. I have, you know, cut a new politics DA for every tournament for the last three years, I'm politics guy, I'm gonna go for politics, great. I think that that is extraordinarily helpful. Having a position that you know super, super well, and you know that in debates where, for example, the affirmative has read a new AF, right? Or you're put sort of strategically off guard by something that you've got a position that's a little bit of a fallback sort of safety position, but just like it's a position that is a generic position that you're well-practiced on, that's gonna to link to most affirmatives, that you know you can go for that you can execute. So I think that that's one consideration. The other consideration is how specific are how specific is my case name? Do I have a case specific strategy 
that I can go for against this affirmative. If you do, you should heavily consider that argument being your ideal 2NR, right? The more specific you can be, the better off you're going to be. And we're going to see this, I think, play out in the camp tournament, right? Where we, for some of these apps, the labs are going to have like hyper-specific strategies that you cut, right? And then maybe for some of these other apps, you're going to be relying on generic positions. And so you're going to see this play out in the same way that it plays out during the regular season, where if you've got specific case neg, you should consider making specific case neg your ideal 2 and R. If you don't have specific case neg, you should have a generic position that you're confident in and that you're comfortable in um, that you should go for in the 2 and R. So I think that, you know, when we're thinking about executing negative positions, the most important thing um, to think about in terms of execution, once again, is this idea of placing maximum pressure on the, on, the, on the affirmative team and making sort of big picture strategic decisions that make the debate smaller for you and make life really, really hard and really, really difficult for the affirmative team. I'll take a short break at this point for questions. That is. How do you feel like is the, this might be a little arbitrary, but like, what do you think is like proper amount of time to spend on case in the block if you want to go for like DA case strategy? It's a good question. So I think that four to five minutes is the appropriate time in the negative block uh, if you're considering um, kind of going for DA case strategies. You want to make sure you've got at least two minutes of time spent on both advantages, right? So you've got to make sure there's enough time that is kind of distributed between the different advantages. So my advice is four to five minutes. Uh, you know, if you can get to six, that's great. Um, but, you know, you've got to make sure you've got multiple offensive options. So that's tough, right? So four to five minutes would be my recommendation for time investment um, in the negative block on case defense arguments. Is reading an impact term plus oh, I think even a good idea to fourth and just like not even advantage? So this is interesting. I, I think that for my thought process on this is typically, I think it depends on how good your impact turn is, right? So if you have a good impact turn that you're investing a lot of time reading cards about, then I would say you want to straight turn that advantage because you want that impact turn to be a strategic option. Um, you, you can, so if the link defense argument is a good argument and you're not like reading five cards in the one and see about the impact turn, I think it's fine to have a diversity of arguments um, against the affirmative team. The, 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 the thing about this that I think is important to think about is that reading impact turn plus case defense does not actually force them to kick the advantage, right? It just means there's offense on the advantage, right? So they're gonna have to answer your offense. It doesn't force them to kick it. Um, so they've got strategic options available there. So sometimes there are situations where you want to have offense plus defensive arguments because you think your defensive arguments are good and you're not like all in on the impact turn. And then I think that's totally appropriate. But I would say a lot of times where, for example, like the A strategy is to go for DDEV or something, you want to straight turn the advantage in that situation. Um, sometimes the, the, the utility of the straight turn strategy is, again, it's, it's pressure on the affirmative, right? You're limiting their strategic options. They have to go, or they have to go for the advantage. They have to answer your impact turn. Because again, in the world where you have defense plus impact turn, they can concede link defense to not answer the impact turn. So they get some positive time trade-offs and that resulting, and that sort of resultant time question. So there's danger there, but sometimes it is worth it if you're like trying to get rid of an advantage. So case by case basis, depending on quality of impact turn, depending on quality of defensive arguments and what the advantage you're debating is. Yeah. Um, what do you think are like the advantages and disadvantages of teams that their strategy are like one-off critiques? So I think that when you're thinking about, so the advantage of one-off critique strategies are you get to really develop your critique position in the one and C. So I, I do think that the, the biggest exception to my 
you want to read sort of optimally four or five off case positions is that situation where the A strategy is a critique. You really want to develop that critique and you want to spend one and see time developing the position. So you get a lead in argumentative development by virtue of being one off and by virtue of reading a relatively large one and seashell with you know cards that are well highlighted and are kind of longer. Um, disadvantages are, well, you limit your strategic options to one argument. And so the affirmative gets to hone in on that argument. Maybe they know a lot about that argument. Um, typically the one-off critique team is not so bothered by this because they are also sort of, they're more familiar with their argument than, the, you know, they think they're more familiar with that argument than anyone is. Um, and, and more well-practiced on that argument than anyone is. But certainly a downside is you've limited your strategic options. You allow the 2AC to spend a lot of time reading cards and making different arguments on the critique. And now, again, like there are situations where sometimes that's not so great for the AF because they read a lot of redundant cards, right? Or they read a lot of cards that say the same thing. I see that happen often in those debates. Um, but... You know, the strategic advantage, the negative gets a lot of argumentative development at the outset. Um, strategic disadvantage, you're limiting your strategic options to one option and the affirmative gets to hone in on that option. Um, and so I really think, you know, in my mind, I, I never I like to embrace debates where, you know, you're sort of taking clash head on and you know what you're going to face. And so I think if you're somebody who's really invested in critique debating, one-off strategies are perfectly fine and 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 maybe even strategically optimal for critiques. Like sometimes they don't really fit well within a bunch of other options and like sort of big four or five off one and C's. Um, and so again, you know, it, it depends on sort of how you feel about the position as a debater, how familiar you are with the position as a debater, what you want your two and R's to be. But yes, one-off strategies, I think, are totally viable for teams who really want to invest in, in critical positions. That is. When you're constructing the block, should the like second piece of offense that isn't your ideal to an R, yeah. should that be, like, when deciding what to make that position, should it be what helps you best, like, get to the ideal to an R, or should it be your plan, like, what would want, what mm -hmm. you want your plan B to an R? So I think usually it's your plan B. Um, some, you know, sometimes it might kind of go along with um, plan A. Like it might be a case turn that sort of fits well with your disadvantage strategy. I also think that there, and you want to kind of play around with different block splits to see what you find exerts sort of maximum pressure on the 1AR. So I always found that like in debates where I was in, whether I was negative or whether I was affirmative giving the one, one AR, that like the two DA block I thought was really threatening, right? Like the two NC is a disadvantage, case defense, one R is a different disadvantage. That's a re That was a really hard block for me to answer. That was a block that I felt exerted a lot of pressure on teams I debated. And so that's a block split that I really, really like. Um, and usually that DA is your plan B DA, right? So it's your sort of secondary DA. And, and there's, you know, you're also trying to make considerations about how does this all fit within the time puzzle, right? Like, so what is the DA that I can extend for three or, or for 330 that kind of fits within that scaffolding? Um, and then, you know, sometimes it's case turn, sometimes T, sometimes it's, you know, sometimes you're in a debate, especially when you're debating a new affirmative or an unpredictable affirmative where the strategic calculus is we need something to do. Uh, we need something to go for when things go wrong. Right. Or like when things kind of go awry. So like they've got a solvency deficit to our counter plan we didn't expect or they've got an angle against our DA we didn't expect. And like we want to make sure that we have a. Uh, you know, an escape route, whether that's topicality, a one sheet process counter plan, something like that, right? So sometimes those considerations play into it. Like the old school advice against new AFs was always extend topicality in the block because you you like you always you want your like escape hatch, hit the red button. Um, here's where I'm going to go. Uh, just in case, because there might be situations where your substantive strategy kind of goes awry. Other questions? I'm now going to talk a little bit about 
thinking about the negative from the perspective of tournament preparation, um, how to kind of go into the year on the negative. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit um, about debating new affirmatives and sort of these edge case scenarios uh, on the negative that I think you want to keep in mind. So how do we debate on the affirmative? How do we debate on the negative um, kind of going into the year? How do we prepare on the negative going into the year? Uh, as I previewed a little bit, I think teams that are successful early in the year are teams that are really successful at going for a small set of generic arguments that they know really well and that they practiced really well, right? So you're going to go into the first tournament of the year, and it is it is highly, highly likely that you're going to debate some affirmatives that you don't have a case negative to or that you don't have a case-specific strategy to, and that is okay, right? Uh, and so the teams that I think end up winning these early season tournaments are often teams that are really, really good at generic strategies that link to a lot of affirmatives um, and that are sort of broadly strategically applicable. So investing in those strategies, I think, is very, very helpful at the outset of the year um, and at the outset of the tournament. Uh, going through the sort of process of what happens when the year evolves, right? So we've debated a couple tournaments. Maybe we're preparing for tournament three or tournament four. Um, and there's a question of, you know, I'm going to the Glen Brooks. There are a bunch of teams on this team's list. How do I figure out who to prepare for, who to write case negatives to? So the piece of advice that I always give for this is you want to create a hit list of teams that you think are uh, sort of within your range to write case negatives to. So my advice is roughly 15 to 20 teams. So pick about five teams that are a little bit better than you, right? These are the teams that sort of your goal is to beat them. Maybe they're your rivals, right? They they go to a rival school or something like that. You really want to debate, you really want to beat them. So teams a little bit better than you, five teams a little bit better than you that you want to beat. Uh, and then five teams that are a little bit worse than you. So these are the teams that like you might debate frequently. These are teams that, you know, maybe on, you know, even playing field, you're like a little bit, you know, technically better at debate than them, but with a good case specific strategy, they could beat you, right? So uh, you want to prepare for five teams a little bit worse than you. And then five teams that are just at your level. And so you will oftentimes see where you go to tournaments and you just like, for whatever reason, there's just this team that you debate every single tournament, right? They're just like always in your bracket. You debate them like 20 times over the course of the year. That team should be on your hit list. You should write a case next to them because you're going to keep debating them. That won't stop for whatever reason. Uh, and then, you know, there are teams that like they're in your same um, bracket. Maybe you debate them in the same elimination rounds or, you know, they tend to be always in the same sort of side of the bracket as you. Uh, once again, five teams at your level. So about 15 teams, five a little better, five a little worse, five at the middle. Cut case negatives to those teams and think about cutting case-specific strategies if at all possible, right? So the, the process for writing case neg that I've um, sort of preached in our lab is you want to start with making sure you have case defense, right? So make sure that you start with the process of killing the case. Um, so think about having both front lines and extensions for your case defense arguments. Think about how you can make link arguments to the generic arguments that you want to go for. And then think about case specific strategies. So if you can find specific counterplan strategies, if you can find specific disadvantage strategies or, you know, new um, link turn angles, those strategies are really good. One other sort of tidbit about this is one thing that I've learned over the years is that non-unique link turn strategies about advantages are some of the best strategies in the negative toolbox because uniqueness arguments about advantages are sometimes the best impact defense arguments. They serve a broad variety of strategic functions because they prove the status quo is good, right? So if you are highly invested in strategic arguments like innovation is high now, the plan is bad for innovation, well, those arguments I think are gonna have a lot of strategic utility because innovation high now is gonna be a feature of like basically every DA case to an R on this topic. So thinking about advantage uniqueness is an area that you invest pretty heavily in in terms of case defense, I think is incredibly, incredibly valuable um, when you're thinking about writing case specific strategies 
um, for kind of advantage structures that you already know about. Debating new affirmatives. So this is one of the most difficult situations to encounter um, as a 2N or, you know, as a negative team just in general, right? And typically these are situations that we most likely encounter either sort of at the very first tournament of the year or this happens, you know, in the postseason at the TOC and in DCA. But there are some ways that I think that we can make this process a little bit easier for us in order to encounter these situations productively. So one piece of advice I always give is, okay, you know, think about gritting out the different affirmatives that could be written and what your strategic pivots would be against different affirmatives. So what I mean by this is the topic usually has different areas and we can think through what different areas might look like. So what are the areas of this topic? Copyright, patent, trademark. So that's one way we can sort of categorize different kinds of affirmatives and think about what would our one and C block split two and R look like be new copyright F versus new patent F versus new trademark F. However, I think that we can break this taxonomy down a little bit more. So I think that we can maybe even break this taxonomy down into new subject matter or uh, enforcement, right? So what does our one and C block split two and R look like against new copyright enforcement AF or new copyright subject matter AF? New patent enforcement, new patent subject matter, new trademark enforcement, new trademark subject matter. And so, you know, that it, it sounds like a lot, but this actually sort of allows your mind to your brain to make what's about to happen feel a little bit smaller because again, you're going to have a plan. So in this situation where you've got a plan for, I know what my one and C is going to look like versus new trademark enforcement. Now, when the AF reads their weird new trademark enforcement app, you, you know what to do. You've got a plan of action that you've set about to do. So grid out the possibilities for different affirmatives, uh, different categories of affirmatives, and think about what would your one and C be ideal block split, ideal two and RB versus the different, you know, affirmatives within that grid and go through that process in the pre-round with your coach. I think that's an incredibly valuable thing to do before a debate starts when you know you are debating a new affirmative case. Um, the other thing to think about, and, and this is something I've already talked about, but like have that, have that argument that you like, right? Have that argument you like to go for against apps that don't link to a lot of things that you feel like you could fall back on. So, you know, you've got the cap K, you've got the politics DA, you've got a process counter plan, you've got T, you've got something that you like to fall back on um, versus some of these new affirmatives. Third, do not forget about killing the case. Okay. What I like to, you know, so what I like to do um, when debating new affirmatives is I would have, so, you know, I would have my flow paper and then I would have a sh separate sheet of paper that I would write down for each advantage. What are the three just like logical objections that I would have to that advantage? Just using my brain, right? And maybe these might be things we have cards about. These might not be things we have cards about. These, you know, some of these might be impact defense arguments. Some of them are not impact defense arguments. I would just write down, like, if I were just academically answering this advantage with three arguments, what are those three arguments? And then when you ask cross-ex questions, you ask about those three things. When you create your one and see on the case, you, you know, are focusing in on those things. That's what you talk about in the block on the case. So, you know, oftentimes when people debate new AFs, they, they feel like, okay, well, the case is new. I don't have answers to it. Therefore, I can't go for case defense in the 2 and R. Wrong. New apps are usually bad. And so usually you often can go for case defense arguments. Have a division of labor between the 2 in and the 1 in in terms of preparing and creating the 1 and C. There are different ways to do this, right? Uh, you can have the maybe the 1 in uh, gets all the off case positions that the 2N tells them to go grab. And then the 2N creates the case defense front lines. Maybe you do the inverse of that. But there should be some division of labor where 1N has a job, 2N has a job, and 2N has a job that allows them to, to like read the cards of the app and flow really closely because that's really important in those new app debates. Um, 
the other thing about this is like use prep early, use prep for the one and see if you have to use prep after the two AC. If you need to like really read through their card, you know, if you're like, I really wanted to go for sui generis in this debate and they read a new card that I've never seen before to answer sui generis. And so like, I just need to take prep to read that card, take prep to read that card, right? Take your time early in the debate and use preparation time so you're not losing the debate early and you're getting a grasp on what their argument is. So use prep early when you're thinking about debating new affirmatives um, and then execute execute your plan with confidence, right? Don't get frazzled. Know that you have a plan for where you're going on the negative and that their F is probably bad, which is why it hasn't been read before, okay? and stay confident in those situations because those are some of the most high pressure situations, the most difficult situations to encounter on the negative. Uh, we'll now take another sort of stop for questions that anyone has. Okay, if there are no other questions, you all can go to your next elective.